Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. I thank you that the world has taken a few moments to render thankfulness for some things. We need to think more about it than we do. We pray now as we have come together that you will share some thoughts with us that we need. May we see how serious it is to be a Christian, to be part of your remnant people, and to be called to service. We pray that we may do than study, more than study, that we may do the things that you say to us. We thank you for guiding us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Since we are a somewhat abbreviated group today, <laughs> we uh, maybe should take this opportunity to move into a different area. We can resume John 14, 15, 16, and 17 next time. But for this time, I've already been stirred up with questions. <laughs> and maybe we should address some of that today in a little more detail than we're used to. The spirit of prophecy has a great deal to say, and very seriously to say, about rebellion. It's a very serious thing, rebellion. Now, as we mentioned here just briefly, we all of us have opinions, okay? And that's okay. There is no problem with us having opinions about various subjects. Everybody is free to believe what they want to believe and live with it. But when it gets to decisions that have been made by the church worldwide, we don't have right to opinions anymore. When the church under God through His Spirit decides something, we have to pay attention. And when a person chooses not to pay attention, I think we can make a very strong case that that is rebellion. Okay, So we're going to look at what the Spirit of Prophecy says about rebellion. Let's uh, go to something very familiar, but uh, yet has a lot of details we can look at. You remember that when Moses went up to the mountain, he came down with the tables of stone that God had written on. But while he was gone, <laughs> The people noticed he was gone. And they said, well, what happened to him? Where did he go? And so they got all agitated. And they said to Aaron, you know, Aaron, maybe you ought to take over here. And you know, Aaron was the kind of a fellow who, oh, really? <laughs> He loved popularity. <laughs> That's the downfall of a lot of people. He loved popularity. He loved being the one that people came to and respected. And he was always there to give them a pat on the back. And so he thought about it and he said, well, okay, since Moses isn't here anymore, they said, uh, we have one little problem we want you to attend to. We need to know that we're headed in the right direction. But in order to do that, we want you to make us a representation of God so we know God is with us. And so he said, okay. So they got together some gold. You know the story. <laughs> He made a calf. They really thought that was great. Oh, we've got a good leader now. This, this fella listens to us. <laughs> We're going to go places now. And they had a party. <laughs> and of course, the more they got into the party, the more partying they did. Until it was a full-blown orgy. Do you know what... Uh, Aaron was doing while they were having their 
party, their dancing, their merriment, and their other activities. He was calm, cool, and collected, and there wasn't a problem in his mind. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Ellen White makes this statement. She says, the Son of God, the Son of God, although invisible to the congregation, was the leader of the Israelites, his presence went before them. Whose presence? Jesus. The presence of Jesus, who she has just called the Son of God. Now, the reason I'm saying this at the beginning of what we're doing here is because when some people say Son of God, they think that means when Jesus became human. Then he was the Son of God. But this statement is about here with the Israelites having their party. <laughs> Jesus is watching. <laughs> While Moses was their visible leader, receiving his directions from the angel who was Christ. Okay. Now we know those things. This is nothing marvelous we're talking about here, but there are a lot of people in this world that don't know that Jesus is the one who is with them. And I think they, the ones who do know forget it's also Jesus who's with us today. Now, he's our comforter. So we talked about that last time. He's our comforter. He is the spirit of truth. He was the spirit of truth to them. He is the spirit of truth to us. Okay? The Bible makes a very interesting statement. It says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. And that's capitalized in the Bible. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not. The angel. See? Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Have you ever seen an angel pardon anybody's transgressions? <laughs> this angel can, according to the Bible. Well, Alan White said that angel is Jesus, okay? So we have no problem with that. But it's right there in the Bible. We don't need the spirit of prophecy to tell us plain Bible things. Except for the fact that we haven't, many of us, read the Bible yet. <laughs> okay. We need to see what the Bible says. We would not have needed the spirit of prophecy if we knew our Bibles. <laughs> but now we have no excuse because we do have the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> God is never going to hear us say, that I couldn't find that any place. He's, he's just going to look at us and say, how come you couldn't find it? It was every place. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Aaron has done this. I don't want you to take my word for anything. I'm going to read it to you. While the top of the mount is still illuminated with the glory of God, he, Aaron, calmly witnesses the merriment and dancing in this senseless, to this senseless image, and Moses is sent down from the mount by the Lord to rebuke the people. So the spirit of prophecy says he was just there watching them calmly, no problem. <laughs> Here they're doing all this wickedness and it's fine with him. Now none of this wouldn't have happened. None of this would have happened if Aaron had said no. But that's not what he did. This whole thing would never have happened. And so Moses is coming down with the stone. And that stone 
Those tablets are a pledge from God that he will accept these people on the condition of their obedience. Okay? This is his pledge. The Ten Commandments. He will make a wall around them to protect them. Alright. So Aaron stood by calmly and patiently and Moses lights into him. <laughs> I'm reading from uh, 3T341. Three testimonies. And so Moses, what they do to you? <laughs> what did they do to you? <laughs> Man, they must have strung him up on a pole and started pulling his arms and his legs up. They must have gone after his tongue to pull it up. Moses said, what did they do to you? <laughs> well, um, they threatened me. <laughs> They wanted a God. And there's so many of them. What can I do? <laughs> there's a million and a half of them out there. <laughs> so I, I threw this stuff in there that they gave me. And look what came out. <laughs> and Moses is looking at him. <laughs> And so Moses let him know a few things right away. It's called stern rebuke. By the way, did God say anything to Moses about the way he was acting? He was doing just what God told him to do. <laughs> There's nothing in the Bible that says he did anything wrong here. He did what needed to be done, and that's what we're going to look at. The man who might have saved the Hebrews in the hour of their peril is calm. He does not show indignation because of the sins of the people. Neither does he reproach himself and manifest remorse under the sense of his wrongs. But he seeks to justify his wrong course. She says that Aaron entered into the Spirit. <laughs> he entered into the spirit and the feelings of the people. <laughs> I thought that was a rather interesting comment because does Satan have a spirit? Yep. Yeah. We've all read Satan's spirit, the spirit of Satan so far. I wonder if anybody believes that Satan has another demon besides himself who's called a Satan. <laughs> so there must be two beings, Satan and his spirit. <laughs> You might try that one on a person sometime and ask them if they believe that there's a Satan and his spirit separate. <laughs> they'll, think you're they'll, they'll think you're crazy. They'll say, who believes that? Oh, somebody believes that. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry to throw these things in, but to me, everything has to make sense. <laughs> What good is a religion that doesn't make sense? <laughs> all right. So the congregation is watching all this. They see Moses and Aaron. Now we're trying to get over to the idea of rebellion here. Because the people are watching. These are the people who just had the party. And here they hear Moses ranting and raving against Aaron saying, what did they do to you? Look at these wicked people! <laughs> and they're... <laughs> and they're saying, you know, he's really got a bad attitude. <laughs> he isn't very nice! <laughs> look at him carrying on! And look at Aaron, he's so calm! And <laughs> So pleasant. <laughs> this Moses is a problem. They did not like his bad spirit. 
Now, why did Aaron get himself over there? What, did, what, what is it we understand here? Why did he do it? He, he wanted to be popular. He wanted to be the good guy. He wanted to, he wanted to save himself. Now I'm going to read you a statement in a spirit prophecy. At this point, she says, Aaron sacrificed thousands of the Israelites. Yeah, to save himself, he sacrificed all these people. That's a terrible thought. But we are sneaking up on the idea of rebellion here and what it means. Okay? And the people started in doing what they do. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Murmuring, complaining, bad mouthing. <laughs> so here they go. Can you imagine a million and a half people <laughs> all started up? Complaining and murmuring. <laughs> what kind of a sound is that? <laughs> and here's Moses. He had been a shepherd. <laughs> Forty years. Taking care of those sheep. People are worried. What a pleasant, happy time that was, just taking care of you. <laughs> and now he's got these million and a half people, and God says, you're the pastor. <laughs> you're the shepherd of them. <laughs> and he's saying, oh, <laughs> give me the sheep. <laughs> I'd rather have the sheep. <laughs> This is like taking care of a bunch of wolves biting each other. <laughs> you know, Alan White says in volume five of the testimonies that we as Seventh-day Adventists, instead of having the love of Jesus, when somebody goes down, something happens, they mess up. The rest of the church members pounce on them like a bunch of wolves instead of trying to save them. No, I didn't say that. You look it up in volume five of the testimonies. It seems that we have some problems we're not addressing. We need to think about these things. Well, about this time, we have to notice what's going on. This is not between Moses and Aaron or Moses and the people. This is about Satan messing up the program with Jesus. See? We see the, the great controversy developing here. Moses and the people and Aaron and all that. That's out in the open. That's the stories we know. But what's going on is Satan is doing something to mess up the plan of God. At this point, we need to see what is it he is trying to do. He wants to neutralize Moses. Okay? That's what he's after here. He's got Aaron. He's got the people. He wants to neutralize Moses. Now I'll read what she says about that. It is the special purpose of Satan to pour upon and around the servants of God's choice troubles, perplexities, and opposition. Well, now you know where that's coming from. <laughs> that's what Satan sets up against the one that God, the ones that God puts in front to speak for him. Opposition, first thing. See? So you might as well expect it. Just expect it. Somebody's going to oppose you when you, you tell the truth according to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. All right. The position of Moses in carrying the burdens that he bore for the Israel of God was not appreciated. There is in the nature of man, when not under the direct 
influence of the Spirit of God a disposition to envy, jealousy, and cruel distrust, which if not subdued, will lead to a, a desire to undermine and tear down others. That's from Satan. You hear something you don't like? It doesn't matter if it comes from the Bible and spirit of prophecy. If you don't like it, you're going to cut somebody down. See? That's the way it goes. So let's start moving towards the concept of rebellion here. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We know those names. They went up there with the 70 elders. They were big shots, you know, these three. They were very intelligent. They belonged to the right families. They went up there and they saw the light like everybody else. In the bottom of the cloud, there was a sapphire foundation. Okay. The Bible says clear like the heavens, like the sky. So it means the sapphire was blue. Which is the color of God's law and obedience to it. Okay. So the symbols are starting to hit us here. God is going to do something with the law. These men are going to do something that the devil did. Because the devil does the same thing. He found out what happened to him. And he uses the same thing on all humans. If he can get them to move with him. The devil you remember. In heaven. He didn't set out to be the rebel. He thought he was going to help things out. He wanted to make heaven a better place to live in. He said. He was going to set everybody at liberty. <laughs> Nobody would be under law and everything would be beautiful. But he didn't get there in one leap. The very first thing he did was talk to the angels and ask them a couple questions. He never made direct statements. He would just ask them questions. He said, I wonder what would happen if any of us did something different from what God thinks. See? <laughs> no big deal, just just a little question. And then later, you know God has a law. Really? He has a law? Where is it? <laughs> oh, well, it doesn't make any difference. What, what, what difference does the law make? None of us. We're all holy. We wouldn't do anything against God's law. And then he would move further and say, you know, why do we need the law since we're holy? <laughs> we don't need it. And he, kept, and he kept building. But what he didn't realize was he was building something in himself that he didn't have when he started. See? And that's what Korah, Dathan, and Abiram did. At first, they just threw out little hints about Moses. They weren't making any statements. They would just throw out little questions. Why are we out here? <laughs> uh, where's he taking us? <laughs> How come he's the leader of a million and a half people? Who gave him that? <laughs> Did we tell him he could do that? <laughs> so, a little by little, they were developing something in their own minds. The devil was developing in them. He was turning them into rebels and they didn't know it. See? He was turning them into the same kind of persons that he is. So, these slight little things that they were saying at first, these hints. A little further in the story on page 343, she says, Each expressing what he thought of certain things which he had come under which had come under his notice. Expressing. There's an important element. When we express something, we hear ourselves say it. And we believe the things we hear ourselves say. 
That's in Desire of Ages 332. We believe what we hear ourselves and be careful what you say. <laughs> you better be sure it's Bible and Spirit prophecy. All right. So here's what she says about it. These deluded souls really came to believe that they had a zeal for the Lord and that they had a good purpose. They really believed it. So we mustn't think of these people as being some kind of knotheads that just wanted to get something away from Moses. They really believed they were doing something right. The devil took them over there. He, he fooled them. He deceived them. And now we're going to start understanding a little bit about what rebellion is and where it comes from, how it happens. Okay, he deceived them into thinking they were doing something good. So now they're feeling strong about this. They're, they're, they're believing what they're saying. So they start spreading it around. And they figured, well, it's not going to do us any good to go after a million and a half people. What are we going to do with them? <laughs> Not very much. So they went after the mightiest men in Israel, the princes, the leaders, the intelligent, powerful ones that everybody respected. And they got 250 of them to believe their way. Of the leaders. It doesn't do any good to get the peons. Get the leaders. The devil is after the leaders. <laughs> and so now they've got themselves, the trika at the top, and the 250 princes, these famous mighty men. And they all had to figure it out. They were going to improve the government of Israel. <laughs> they were going to improve the administration of all these people. And Korah, of course, knew what his position would be in this new order. He was going to be exalted to the priesthood. <laughs> Because it really bothered them that the priesthood was just one family. It was Moses and Aaron and their family. <laughs> they said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How can you keep it all in your family? <laughs> Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were slick. They were very intelligent. And they knew there was something they could use on those people that they didn't have to use with the, two, the, the princes. The princes had the power already. <laughs> the people were just the people. So now they had to do something with the people to bring them across. And the devil gave them the tool and they didn't know it was the devil who did it. The tool was flattery. Always works. <laughs> flattery. You're all holy. <laughs> You're the holy people of God. We are Israel. Who does Moses think he is telling us we're sinners all the time? <laughs> Who needs that? <laughs> Why, that's discouraging to keep hearing we're sinners. <laughs> What's wrong with him? <laughs> we're holy. All of us, we're all holy. <laughs> and the people, yeah! <laughs> That's right! <laughs> you can hear them on the streets, somebody tell everybody they're holy. <laughs> now here's the spirit of prophecy. There is nothing which will please the people better 
than to be praised and flattered when they are in darkness and wrong and deserve reproof. Now, this isn't just the Israelites we're talking about. (laughs) Today, right here in this spot, there is nothing the people like better than to be praised. (laughs) Oh, the devil's got tricks. He's got tricks. The people thought about it for a minute and they said, you know, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they're right. They hit the nail right on the head. Moses is too harsh. (laughs) He's too exacting. He's too dictatorial. (laughs) And he keeps reproving us like we're all sinners. (laughs) We're holy people. We're the church. (laughs) Oh, Oh, the devil had him. The devil had him. <laughs> Poor Moses, he's listening to all of this. <laughs> no, we need a new leader here. We need a new leader. We need somebody who will listen to us. We need somebody who's not so unyielding, so exacting. We need somebody who will bend and understand where people just like they are. You know, we're not really asking for a bunch. We just want our rights. (laughs) We want our rights. (laughs) And here's Moses, the meekest man on earth, which means he's the most in self-control. He's right there with God. And he's listening to all of this. And he's wondering, where are they going to go with this? Where are they going with this? And Korah steps up and he says, I want to tell you all something. Why we're out here in the desert. Why it doesn't seem like we're headed any place. Moses brought us out here not because God told him to bring us out here. God didn't do that. He wouldn't do that to us. <laughs> he brought us out here to get all of our possessions and make himself rich. And there's only one way he's going to be able to accomplish that. That's for all of us to die out here. And then he's got them all. <laughs> and Moses, oh... <laughs> Can you believe it? A million and a half people are saying, he's not going to get mine. (laughs) So Moses finally speaks up. And he says, well, tell you what, everybody come here tomorrow. And we'll see who's holy. (laughs) <laughs> we'll just see who is holy <laughs> and we'll see who God has chosen and who he hasn't chosen he says you know you've taken too much upon yourself you just have taken too much upon yourself does it seem a small thing to you Levites, that you have separated yourself from the whole congregation? Didn't God say it's okay for you to be over here because you didn't stay with the rebellion before? But now, where are you? What's going on here? He hath brought thee near to him. 
and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? Oh, there's a problem in the camp here. Well, I'm not going to read everything it says there. You read Deuteronomy for yourself, what's going on. So they're going to play Moses' words back to him. He says, well, is it a small thing for you? With no authority at all to have brought us all out here to kill us? How are you going to make this work? Are you going to take our eyes out? What do you mean by that? He said, do you really think we're so blind? We're going to just keep following you wherever you go? <laughs> we are not stupid blind people. Well, this is getting to be a problem here. Moses, there's a reason we didn't go over there in 11 days. It's just 11 days from there to over there. There's a reason we're still wandering around out here. You're working your agenda. And that agenda is no good for us. You're going to get us all killed. You said we're all going to die out here in the desert. God didn't say that. You said it. You want to get rich. And I don't know about you, but I think if I was Moses, about this time I'd want to cry. <laughs> so, you poor people, what are you talking about? What are you saying? How can you believe that? <laughs> he was moved. This is the self-sacrificing man. And that's the one thing the devil hates is a self-sacrificing person because that person is like Jesus. See? Tomorrow, tomorrow you bring your censors. Now, how come they had censors? That was part of the tools of the priests. <laughs> and they all had their censors and they all had incense. And they were all ready to be priests. <laughs> and so Moses said, well, you bring your censors. Bring them tomorrow. <laughs> and we'll let the Lord take care of this. I'm going to read you now from 349. It says, these rebellious ones. Oh, now she's using the word. These rebellious, what is, what is making them rebels? That's what we have to see here. These rebellious ones had flattered the people in general to believe that they were right and that all their troubles arose from Moses. All the people now are believing Moses is the problem who was continually reminding them of their sins. The people thought that if Korah could lead them and encourage them by dwelling upon their righteous acts, <laughs> instead of reminding them of their failures, they would have a peaceful, prosperous journey. And he would no doubt lead them, not back into the wilderness, but into the promised land. So we see how the devil flattered the people. By saying, we're holy, we're the church, we don't do anything wrong. But this Moses, he keeps telling us, we're sinners. <laughs> so let's get rid of Moses. Well, you know the next part of the story, and now it begins to focus for us. The Lord appeared. The Lord appeared. And the people said, well, uh, should we die because of one man? <laughs> and Moses said, get up from the tabernacle of Korah. 
Dathan and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went to Dathan and Abiram. The elders of Israel followed him. He said to the congregation, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs lest ye be consumed in their sins. Don't touch anything of theirs. Have you heard that someplace? Touch not. Touch not. You must have clean hands to serve the Lord. That's New Testament, isn't it? Well, here's, here's Jesus doing it in a very practical way. He says, don't you touch what they, they have done. And he called them wicked men. And so Moses says, okay, people, you better start backing away because we're not going to do something ordinary here. The Lord is going to do something that you haven't seen before. If they would just lay down and die, that would mean nothing. But if you see the earth open up and swallow them, you will understand something's happened here. You better get away from them. <laughs> and of course, we know what happened. <laughs> The earth just cracked open. And their whole families, their tents, everything fell in the hole. And they were alive when this was happening. So they were screaming and hollering and all the people were watching this. And they got some distance between them and that hole. There they go. Now something that's not, I don't believe, all that clear in the Bible, but there was a little bit of time between that happening to Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And what happens next? God gave a little bit of time here so that the 250 princes could think about it and repent. So they could realize, you know, we were taken in here. We really shouldn't be doing this. We need to get back with God. But none of them repented. <laughs> none of them repented. Now they saw that hole. They saw. And for some reason it didn't <laughs> compute. <laughs> And so since it didn't work, fire came down from God and consumed. It burned everything they had. But the censers were left. Yeah. And so God told Moses, gather up the censers. We're not going to forget today. You gather up the censers and you pound them into plates. And we're going to use those to protect the altar. Put those on the altar. These have been tested by fire. And that's where those plates that were around the altar came from. It's from this. Okay. They had been given opportunity to repent and nothing happened. And the people went back to their tents. Now, would you suppose they have it figured out now? This doesn't pay? <laughs> you would think that there was a brain somewhere in there in each of those million and a half people. <laughs> Look at this. It doesn't pay to go against God. <laughs> But all they could think about, Moses has abused us. We have to do something about him. 
They didn't get any messages. <laughs> they had a problem. It was a legal problem in their mind. Okay? Moses had told them, You're all going to die in the desert. And they said, No, we're not. You're a deceiver. <laughs> and they had believed that he told them a lie. Just so he could keep them out there. So they would die. So they said, no, no, you made that up. We're not going to die. But now, after they saw the hole, they saw the fire. They said, well, wait a minute. If we admit Moses is right... <laughs> That means we're going to die in the desert. <laughs> he can't be right. <laughs> he tricked us. Somehow he killed Korah and he killed those princes. <laughs> so their minds couldn't change. They had it figured out. Moses is still the problem. <laughs> They were not going to believe they were going to die in the wilderness. They were not going to believe that. Now we're ready to begin analyzing rebellion. Where it comes from. Why a person can't get over it very easily. And the power of it. It's not people going against something. They're doing something they believe in. Okay? They believe what they're doing is right, but it's still rebellion. Now let's, let's get to the bottom of that. I'm going to read you a sentence now from page 351. Satan can lead deceived souls to great lengths. He can pervert their judgment, their sight, and they're hearing. He can make them see things they don't see. And he can make them hear things that aren't there. And through that process, he can pervert their judgment. They don't have anything to work with. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that's very scary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he can do that with church members. He can do it with union presidents. Uh-oh. So the people were disappointed. They're depressed. They came out Moses' way. He wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> and it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, they looked toward the tabernacle and behold... The cloud. <laughs> the cloud. <laughs> Covered. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Get away from them. <laughs> Get away from them. So that I can consume them all <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> oh, what a message. <laughs> Come on, Moses, move! <laughs> and Moses, oh, I understand, Lord, I understand, but please, you've got to spare your people. <laughs> spare them! And Moses said, Aaron, get a, get a sensor, come on, move, get a sensor. Start burning the incense. Go to the people quick before this, this takes care of all of them. <laughs> and that's what they did. Aaron did. He got up. He went through the people. The plague had already started. They were dying already. And the Lord paid attention to what Moses and Aaron were doing. And he stopped the plague. But by the time he stopped it, 14,700 people were dead. 
Now, I don't know if you can visualize that many people. <laughs> 14, 15,000 people dead. Aaron's fault. See? So why are we doing the story today? Well, first of all, somebody talked at the beginning before we had a meeting today. and We were talking about rebellion. We're trying to understand this. Rebellion. Why? We don't have that problem, do we? Well, Paul said all these things happen as in samples so that we can see how it works. And not fall into the traps. These were written for us. That's what Paul says. Mm -hmm. At the end of time. That's us. Seventh day Adventists. Mm -hmm. This is not written for the Baptists. The Nazarenes. The... This is written for the seventh day Adventists. And when somebody says. Well, what are you saying? You mean there are deceived seventh day Adventists? Come on. <laughs> Hey, I heard that in a church not far away from here. They got mad at me because I made the suggestion we have deception in our ranks. Yeah. They said, you get out of here. We don't need to hear that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, I know about this. <laughs> Quoting, we have evidence in God's word of the liability of his people to be greatly deceived. Now that's the spirit prophecy. We may expect just such things in these last days. For Satan is just as busy now as he was in the congregation of Israel. The cruelty and strength of prejudice are not understood. In our ranks, prejudice in our ranks that we don't understand the power of it. Well, we might get a taste of it here. I don't know what prejudice does. What the bias of a certain doctrine does when, they, when the establishment disagrees with your version of the Bible. We may get a taste. Ellen White has just warned us here that it's here today. After the congregation had evidence before their sight of the destruction of these leaders in rebellion. It's the leaders that were in rebellion. They stirred up the people. The power of suspicion and distrust which had been let into their souls was not removed. They saw the ground open up. It, sh it should have cured them. It should have led them to repentance. He gave them all opportunity to see. And to understand the sinfulness of their course. He gave, I'm quoting now the deceived ones, overwhelming evidence that they were sinners. Overwhelming evidence. And of course that meant that Moses was right. So God looking upon all of this. With Moses there. And the rebellious ones over there. And what was in God's heart at this moment? What was, was, what was he thinking what was he experiencing as God? He pitied the ignorance and the folly of those who had been deceived. 
Well, if that's where God is, that's where we're supposed to be. Pity the ignorance and the folly. Moses is trying to get them to understand, to repent, to seek forgiveness. And if they had repented, everything would have turned around. But they didn't repent. I'm going to skip the part where she talks about 1 Corinthians 3, where Moses went up and he comes down again with his face all shiny and it scared him. You read that for yourself sometime. That's quite a story. You'll want to know it because the churches who speak against the Sabbath say, turn that all around backwards. It never comes out right the way they say it. This story is telling us about the rebels and is telling us about God's willingness to forgive. He wants to forgive. He wants them to return to him. But we need a sentence here you might want to write down in, in a card someplace and look at it every now and then. It says, it is hardly possible for men to offer a greater insult to God than to despise and reject the instrumentalities that he has appointed to lead them. Now, Ellen White knew that one inside and out because she had that experience in the Seventh Day Adventist Church of having people constantly telling her, you didn't get that from God, somebody told you. She had that. You and James are too harsh. <laughs> you speak too plainly. <laughs> How come you're always telling us we're sinners? <laughs> And yet through all of this, she speaks of Jesus as their invisible leader, bringing a special, irresistible interference from heaven to keep them from being all killed. And then she tells us something. She says, the repentance and humiliation of the congregation must be proportionate to their transgression." You don't just say, I'm sorry. That doesn't cut it. You have to really be sorry. <laughs> I have this one in blue in my computer. They did not realize the importance of immediate action. I'll get around to that next week. I'll pray about it. <laughs> I'll wait till I get conviction. Those are all killers. You, you get into that routine. It's never going to happen. Tomorrow never comes. Immediate action when God talks to us. We are to do something now, today. So the, the children of Israel had a night to sleep on it, right? God, didn't Moses say, you come back tomorrow? So they had a whole night to think about these things, to pray about it, to hear the voice of God talking to them. All night they had. Now God told Moses, step back, I'm going to take care of this right now. And Moses said, no, 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 no don't do that. <laughs> so they got a whole night out of it. But they didn't spend the night confessing and repenting. They were looking for a way to resist everything God had shown them. They spent the night trying to figure out how to get to Moses. 
They had it in their mind. The devil had convinced them that Moses and Aaron are wicked men. So if you ever have that experience, somebody coming at you saying, man, you believe that? Oh, you're a blasphemer. You're a heretic. You're wicked. We need to kick you out of this church. Yeah. That's exactly what's going on here. These are wicked men. Now, we've got to find somebody who'll give us some prize. We don't need all this reproof. You have killed Moses. You have killed the people of the Lord. <laughs> That's what they came up with after the night. <laughs> you have killed the people of the Lord, the holy ones. <laughs> And they were so vehement about this, they were ready to lay hands on Moses and Aaron and do them in. But here comes the cloud again. Here comes the cloud. Come on, Moses. These people have settled in to rebellion. They've settled in. In another place, she says, genuine rebellion is not curable. Mm -hmm. Now that is really fearful. Genuine, because the devil has taken possession, that's why. Now you're ready for the scripture. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion is not something we can play with. Rebellion is not something we can ignore. Rebellion is not something that's going to go away. It's witchcraft. 1 Samuel 15, 23. It's idolatry. What is idolatry? It's something that has taken the place of God. Do we today have a problem with any of this? When the general conference in session decides something, the spirit of prophecy tells us there is no more discussion. No more discussion. When people keep bringing it up again and bringing it up again and even voting against it, that is rebellion. It is rebellion against the highest authority on the earth. And that is a problem. And God has demonstrated what he does about it. He makes a big hole and he rains down fire. And I sure wouldn't want to be where all that's happening. But it's going to happen. There are no games being played here. People think they're cute by saying we got 75% of the people voting our way. Well, there were 250 princes with Korah, David, and Abiram also. And yet Moses mediated for them. <laughs> yeah. He prayed for them. He said, Lord, you take me with them. <laughs> This one I haven't read. By his intercession, he held back the arm of vengeance that a full end was not made of disobedient, rebellious Israel. They were not killed off then. It should have happened right then. 
But because Moses stood for them, God said, okay, we won't do it on that. Okay, we've got a little taste of rebellion, how God does it, how He deals with it, what He means for us not to be rebels. Now let's uh, bring it forward now. We do not consider that our dangers are any less than those of the Hebrews, but greater. That's on page 358, volume 3, testimony. We face greater dangers today in the Seventh-day Adventist Church over rebellion than the Hebrews did. Now, I didn't plan to get into this subject today, but you know where the subject goes? It's a select message in volume 1 around page 202 and following. It's called the Alpha and the Omega. Now we have had the Alpha. It was John Harvey Kellogg. It was several people fighting over something. Do you know what the issue was in the Alpha? The personality of God. That was the Alpha. So what do you suppose the Omega is going to be? The nature of God. The Omega in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to be over the Spirit of God. How can we have slept through all this? There will ever be a spirit to rise up against the proof of sins and wrongs. But shall the voice of reproof be hushed because of this? If so, we shall be in no better situation than are the various denominations in our land who are afraid to touch the errors and the prevailing sins of the people. She just said, Babylon's in our midst. Like all the Sunday keeping churches, we're afraid to tell our people they're sinning. And we certainly are afraid to tell them of the, the errors they are believing because we're teaching them. If those who are placed in important positions never reproved, never rebuked, there would soon be a demoralized condition of things that would greatly dishonor God. How should we give this reproof? With long suffering and doctrine. The wrongs of God's people cannot be passed by indifferently. And indifference is the right word. I find it more and more difficult to strike up a conversation with people in leadership over simple subjects because they don't believe that way. God requires his servants to be always in earnest to do his will. To do his will. And so she goes back to the Hebrews. She says the Hebrews were not willing to submit to the directions and restrictions of the Lord. They simply wanted their own way to be controlled by their own judgment. And they were restless under restraint. I'm glad I got here because uh, we're running out of time. We hear the plea. Now this is Ellen White talking. She says, we hear the plea. Oh, I am so sensitive. I cannot bear the least reflection. And then she says, if 
those persons would take, state the case correctly, they would say, quote, I am so self-willed, so self-sufficient, so proud-spirited that I will not be dictated to, I will not be reproved, I claim the right of individual judgment. I have a right to believe and talk as I please. Now she wrote that a long time ago. In that same volume 3, page uh, 307, you might want to go read that sometimes. She's talking to a young minister in our church and his wife. And he said these very words to himself. And she had an angel tell her, this is what he's thinking. As she recorded the words, it says this is what he was, he was having a conversation with himself. I will not be dictated to. <laughs> I have the right of judgment. And who he was saying those things to was Ellen White and James White. Yeah. He was not going to listen to the spirit prophecy. And she was trying to warn him and tell him, you know, you're stepping over a line. You need to confess to God. You need to be converted. You need to stop being self-exalted. She says, if we went to heaven, you would not be happy there. <laughs> yeah. You go read some of this in volume three of the testimonies. The history of the Israelites presents us the great danger of deception. She talks about the people who fall into that deception. They do not wish to be disturbed. This class never see the necessity of the plain testimony. They don't want to know what God says. They don't want to know the spirit of prophecy. They don't want to have somebody who does know it tell them. I'm going to finish now. By the way, I have been leaving out all her references to the spirit of God. Because I don't want to detract from what we're talking about. But all through this, she's saying the spirit of God. She never says somebody else the spirit of God now I'm going to finish this she's quoting from John neither pray I for these alone but for them also which shall believe in me through their word that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me. That's the Father, that's the Son, and us. That's all there is. <laughs> okay? That's how she finishes this article on rebellion. The Father... The Son in us. That the world may know thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Let's keep reading. Let's keep studying. Let's understand the real issues. Don't go where the devil wants you to go. The ordination of women is not an issue. Don't get caught up in it. That's a false issue. The issue is not what your opinion is. The issue is, are you going to stay with God when His Spirit deals with a general conference in session and God says, this is what we do as a people. That's what we do. <laughs> We're one people under the true Spirit. So, so don't get caught up in the devil's diversions. He's always going to invent a new one. <laughs> he keeps finding new things for us to talk about. We don't have anything to do with that. We have a, a mission. It's called the third angel's message. We have a world to warn. Let's talk to somebody. Let's let the spirit use us. 
And let's not go anywhere near rebellion. <laughs> Leave it alone. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the earnest work of Ellen White writing when nothing else worked in her whole body but her forearm and her hand to give us these messages. Father, we're so thankful that we have no excuses, none. They're all taken away. If there's something we don't understand, you will teach us. If we're having a hard time with the Bible, there's no excuse. You gave us a spirit of prophecy. We can't have a problem with the spirit of prophecy. It's in our own language. The only problem we'll have is if we don't want to hear it, if we don't want to know. But then we're turning our backs on your voice. Help us. Help us to turn aside from Satan's sophistries, from his tricks, from his flattery, from his voice telling us we're holy people. Well, we're supposed to be holy, but we better realize we're nothing without Jesus. Help us to receive his righteousness and not let us be fooled by something called righteousness by faith. You're not taking people to heaven because of their faith. You're taking them there because they have the righteousness of Jesus. Help us to understand. Help us experience. Help us to know. And then in that knowledge, may we have the joy, the peace that passes all understanding so that we can talk to someone else. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.